if you want to keep your data safe, the only real logical, reasonable, advisable uh, thing you can do there is to use a strong encryption that you didn't implement or write yourself. Uh, but uh, that's not what we're going to do today. Now, today we're going to talk about hiding your data so that people don't even know it's there, right? If, the, if your data is encrypted and there's a binary blob, people have something to attack. They have something to try and crack. Whereas if they just open up a WAV file and they press play and they hear the sound of it and nothing is out of the ordinary, then they're very unlikely to suspect that there's actually data hidden within that file. Today, what we're going to be talking about and implementing from scratch is something called steganography. And this is the idea of just hiding data in another kind of data stream. You can actually do this with lots of kinds of data, uh, lots of different kinds of data formats, let's say, on computers. Uh, sound is a good candidate. Images are also very good candidates. And we'll see why these, these kind of files work really well for this. But I uh, just want to give a quick refresher on how audio works or how it's stored in computers generally. Um, OK, so what I've got here on top is kind of an analog waveform of sound. Um, so, you know, so sound is actually pressure in the air, um, uh, waves of pressure. So sometimes it's positive pressure, sometimes it's negative, And it's generally we can represent that with a wave. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's high pressure and this is higher volume and then it gets low and there's lower pressure and it's also higher volume. But uh, this is this is kind of how sound uh, looks in an analog way. If you hook up an oscilloscope to a microphone, this is what it will look like. OK, but in uh, in computers, we don't have this sort of like continuous, uh, you know, analog world. We actually have a digital quantized world. So what we generally do is to store data in what's called PCM format. That's pulse code modulation. And what that essentially is, is basically sort of taking a regularly spaced interval of time and taking a sample of the of the, the magnitude of the wave, or rather the, the, the actual value of the wave at that given slice of time. And so that's what you can see here. You can see kind of a digital representation where we've segmented time out into uh, individual slices and uh, we've taken a sample. And there are actually, uh, you know, there is some clever math that goes into this where if you sample fast enough, you can actually faithfully recreate um, analog waveforms as long as you are above uh, two times above the signals that you are trying to capture the frequency of. Of course, sound has lots of frequencies in it, so that's kind of a difficult thing to do in, in the general sense. But this is kind of how we represent audio data. And, and you can imagine, right, these are just numbers. So we have one number here, we have one number here, we have one number here. It's all just numbers. And uh, as long as we understand the sampling uh, frequency, uh, like how many of these we have per second, we can sort of reconstruct this uh, back into a into a, a, a listenable format, so to speak. And of course, we need to know the sort of the, the upper and lower bounds of this uh, of this data. And it's generally 16 bit. It can be larger. There's there's not too much more reason to use something like 16 bit, but you can if you want. OK, so the trick here with hiding data is that we want to somehow get an, an additional channel of information um, like a file that we want to save, which is also just bytes, also just numbers. Um, and we want to somehow find a way to stuff it into these samples, but in a way that it doesn't actually affect the overall sound of the wave uh, or the visual appearance of it, right? We also don't want to have that someone opens this thing up in Audacity and they say, that looks weird. That's not the way that should be. So. The way you have to kind of think about this is that uh, if you've got like a 16-bit number um, and we're, we're sort of measuring its volume essentially in this value uh, at any given moment and sort of the progression of volume change over time gives us the sound. So if you imagine that we've got at one sample time, we've got 100% volume. Uh, just imagine, forget about the negative uh, <laughs> 
the negative axis. Let's call this like absolute magnitude of volume. And then at some the next moment we have 98% volume and then we have uh, sometime later 50%, 49%. Well, um, in your ear, you don't really hear the a, a large difference between let's say 100% and 98%. Like there's not a huge difference. Although 2% is, I'm stretching the, uh, the, the, the metaphor a little bit here. Like 2%, you don't really hear that. That's not gonna be something big difference. Um, 50 to 49%, that's also not something that your your ear is going to detect. And therefore, you know, we could swap these around and the sound would sa sound the same. And actually the waveform would probably be a little bit weird if you really zoomed in on it, but it wouldn't make a big difference. So the idea here is that, you know, small changes uh, don't affect the perception. And uh, that's, that's quite important. And there's another observation, which is that those small changes, if you make a small change um, in a number, and we're going to think about this in binary now for a minute. Um, so let's say we have 52% of a, uh, of, of a, a 16 bit number, uh, a 52% positive value, then um, it's going to look something like this in binary. And if we go to 51%, well, you can say you can see that you know these are the bits that have the most weight at the end. They're sort of the the bits doing the heavy lifting. If you have a, a number which is a million and one, you know the one isn't doing a lot of heavy lifting there. The million is doing uh, most of the work. So it's the same here in binary. You know the numbers up up at the top here, the very topmost bit represents 50% of the total value of this number, and as we go down and we step down in the bit places, each place is worth half as much. Um, and by the time you get down to the end, those bits are really not sort of like worth a whole lot in the grand scheme of things, in the sort of total 16-bit space. They're really only going to be worth, let's say, those those bottom two bits, they're really only worth about 3% of the total value. So the idea here is going to be that we're going to stuff our data into those two bits at the end of each sample. Uh, and that's going to look something like this. So I've got this little table here. And let's imagine we're trying to hide the byte A5. It's not um, a whole data stream here. We're just trying to hide one byte. We've got the byte A5. In binary, that looks like 10100101. And let's say we got these samples over here. And they're all 16 bit. And so at each step of time, we're just going to take the bottom two bits and we're gonna hide, we're just gonna replace the bits that we have at that position, right? It's not gonna make a difference to the sound or the value because we're just changing bits that can have a maximum value of three. So it doesn't really change a whole lot here. We're sort of subtracting two. And uh, so we end up with our bits here. And then we move on to the next low two bits here, which is also zero one. Then we stuff those on the end here. So in, in this case, you know, we swap the bits around here. It's, it doesn't make a big difference again. Then again, we're sort of just stuffing these bits down here and then the topmost, most significant bits, they get stuffed into the next one. So you can see that this takes four samples per per byte that we want to store. So it's not an efficient uh, storage mechanism, um, but this is a way that we can essentially take existing data uh, and encode our own data in a sort of side channel. Um, I guess it's not really in a side channel, it's in the main channel. We, we're, we're piggybacking on the, on, the main, uh, <laughs> on the main data, so to speak, like carrier wave, and uh, we're gonna put our own data on the top of that. Uh, you know, just very low, um, with a very low value. Okay, so four samples uh, per byte, each sample 16 bits, so we have to store four, uh, eight, eight bits, we need uh, 64 bits. So it's not, yeah, it costs us something to do that. All right, so this is the scheme. This is how it works. And this is also the reason that it works really well in images, because in images, uh, you also have three uh, channels. There are maybe four, depending on how you count them, but you have three channels of information. You have red, green, and blue to play with. And generally, images are stored in 24-bit uh, 
tw uh, encoded as 24-bit number, so you have eight bits for each of the channels. And while the eye really can't detect small changes, you know, from one bit or two bits, it can't really detect those kind of changes. And this is actually the reason that compression works so well on images. Um, it is basically because if you sort of quantize them down and you do that in a smart way, you really can't pick it up with the, the human eye. Of course, machines can pick it up, but um, the human eye is really bad at that kind of sort of, especially sort of large dynamic range kind of things. Okay, so um, the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna implement two files. I'm gonna do this in Python today, just to mix it up. And uh, they're gonna be decode and encode. This is the existing, uh, the existing files I have. So I'll just um, rename those for now. So let's move uh, decode to underscore decode.py. We'll keep it around in case we need to reference it. And encode uh, will be encode.py. Okay, and then we're just gonna recreate those. And what I've got here is a, a test wave. You probably won't hear this, I'll cut this in. But that is a five second square wave uh, of information. I think it's a square wave, it may actually be a sine wave. It's a five seconds of 440 hertz, I believe. So um, not an exciting piece of audio, but it will work either way, right? And uh, if you have a more interesting piece of audio, it will work even better. Um, and then we've got this image of a parrot here. Um, it's a JPEG. I've actually compressed this to make it, you know, smaller and, and take less space up because we do have a space limit inside. Um, so I've taken this, but it's a reasonably, you know, decent quality picture. And uh, this is gonna act as our sort of hidden information. So let's start out here. I'm gonna create a, a file called encode because we might as well start with the encoding part. And I've also got one file already sort of ready here, and that is a wave parser. So the reason I'm not gonna build this whole thing out from scratch is because I've actually made a whole video about the wave file format and building a parser and an encoder for it. So I'm not gonna go into all of that now. We're just gonna use this little parser that I've built using Construct, which is a Python library. Um, and basically this acts as both a, a parser and an encoder. So it's a really useful two-way um, binary format library construct. It's really cool. Um, yeah, for, for us, it's just gonna work as the as a black box in this, uh, this video. So I'm gonna import uh, from wav import, and what's it called? It's just called wave struct. And the wave we have is test wave, so let's open that already. So with open test.wave, and we're gonna be reading this file in binary format, and we need to read that as f. We will get the, the wav bytes by doing f.read. Okay, so now we've opened our wave file, we need to parse it, so I'm gonna create wav parsed, and we're gonna do that by using our wave struct and calling the parse method and just passing in the wave bytes. So that's gonna give us um, some information back. So we have wave passed, and it just gives a, a dictionary. It, you don't um, get the information out of this to the, the type information, but basically we're gonna go into the wave struct and we've got this thing called a data subchunk. So that's gonna be kind of the next part in there that we look at. And then inside the data subchunk, eventually we get data and the data is basically just um, signed 16-bit integers. So just like we discussed uh, in the draw.io file, so I'm just gonna bring that data out so that it's easier to work with. And now we need the data of our, of our main file. So this is gonna be parrot.jpg. So we'll do the same thing. We'll open up the parrot.jpg file. It's also a binary file, and we'll call that parrot bytes. And now we should be able to print, um, well, let's do a quick calculation. The uh, 
the number of uh, the number of bytes that we can maximally store inside is the number of samples that we have divided by four. And that is because in every sample we can store two bits and four times two bits is the number of bytes uh, that we can store. So uh, four times two gives us a byte. And yeah, so we need to take the total number of sa uh, samples we have and divide it by four. Okay, so um, total, well, let's call, let's call it available space. That is uh, the length of data uh, divided by four. And this needs to be a round number, like a, uh, a fixed round number. Um, so we need to bring in math so that we can round this down. Math the floor. Uh, because this will give us a, a floating point number. And the, the number of bytes we need to store is just the length of uh, parrot bytes. So let's just do a little thing here. Um, wait, uh, number of samples. Number of samples we have is just the length of data. Then uh, the bytes to store. That is the length of the parent bytes. And, oh no, let's use our available space here. Okay, and then uh, if the length of parent bytes is greater than the available space, then we're going to print uh, not enough space to store hidden file. And then we will just exit so we can continue on as if nothing happened. Now I'm actually going to use a bit more space than this because I want to be able to store the number of bytes that we have uh, the, the number, I want to store the size of the file that we're, we're encoding into this thing so that when we decode it, we know how many bytes to read and reconstruct. Um, but let's just run this already just to make sure uh, there are no bugs. So I'm going to run encode.py. And so the available space is 55,125 bytes and we're going to store 26,195. So we have uh, enough space for that. Um, that's good. And we're going to use, uh, I guess, well, a few more because I, I think we'll store, I don't know, a 32 bit integer to store this. Okay. So now in order to, um, in order to actually store a value at a given, uh, at a given sample, I want to just write a function to do that. So let's write, uh, def, uh, like write hidden byte. So we're going to have a byte that we're going to write and we're going to have uh, a position that we should write that to, like a starting position. So I, I guess I'll call it an index. And how do we do that? So we need to write four, we need to write to four contiguous samples. Uh, so let's start out with a, a loop for i in range uh, four. And we're going to have our byte. So let's imagine, <laughs> let's, uh, let's imagine we have uh, the same value again, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero. I think I swapped that around this time. So we're going to first encode these two bits, then these two bits, then these two bits, then these two bits. So we're, we're doing least significant bit pair first, and we're going to store that per sample. So when we, come to read it out, we're going to do it the other way around, but that doesn't matter. So we're going to start here. Um, okay, so 
uh, I guess I'm just reading directly from the, let's also take in the, the data that we wanna work with in this case. So it's gonna be data at index plus i. It's just gonna equal, and well, that's gonna be what we have at data index plus i. Um, then we need to get rid of the last two bits. So essentially we wanna keep everything. We wanna keep those most significant 14 bits. I think the easiest way to do that is to just um, mask them off like this. So we're gonna do FF, F, um, what's the number I want here? I guess it's C, right? And that, that gives us like all ones except for the last two bits. And then next to that, we can or in uh, the byte. So it's gonna be the byte, um, the byte and the bottom two bits, which is three. So that gives us those bottom two bits. Then after that, we can shift those, shift those bits off. So essentially we're shifting new zeros in here and we are pushing those bits out. And now we've got these two bits in the position next time. So we can shift those out uh, sequentially. Um, okay, so we're gonna do this. And then is there anything else we need to do? Well, I think we are gonna need to correct this data because uh, what's gonna happen when we do this AND operation is this 16-bit signed integer which may be negative, um, it's gonna be encoded in two's complement, uh, which means that there'll be a one in the most significant bit, and uh, you know we'll have to do some bit flipping to, to get back to the positive value, or that, that's how it's encoded anyway. When we do this operation, the number is gonna be positive. We're gonna get like a positive integer back out of this, and we wanna kind of convert it back into a signed integer, so I think I'll make another function called as uh, i16, which would just take a value and we will return that and we need to basically re-encode it. And I think the way that we will re-encode it is just by checking if the most significant bit is a one. Um, and if it's a one, that means the number should be negative and we, we should sort of re, ne uh, well, <laughs> flip it back to being a negative number, an actual negative number. Um, okay, so basically if value and hex 8000, like if there is something left after that, this is basically having a one in the most significant bit position. So if there is something non-zero, that means that the number is uh, is signed. So the way that we're gonna flip it back is that you, you have to flip all the bits in the number um, and there's no, uh, like in JavaScript, we have this bit flip um, negation operation, a unary operation, uh, and C in, in every other language. Now, Python doesn't have it because Python's integers are like, uh, I'm losing the word for this right now, but they're variable width. So Python has variable width integers, which means there's no real sensible way to flip all the bits, right? Because if you think about it, a variable width integer, if you have the number one, it's basically infinite number of zeros before it and then the number one. So if you were to flip, what should what should all those infinite zeros become? So the only sensible way to do this is to uh, to to use a an XOR operation instead. XOR is gonna do the same thing in this case. So we can use uh, our value XOR with FF, FF. So that's the high, that's all ones. And when you do an exclusive or, um, you, f you basically flip the bit. If you flip, if you XOR with one, you're flipping whatever the other value is. So this will flip our, uh, our bits and then we can just add one to that. And that go, that's the twos complement method for going from a, you know, a, a, an encoded negative number to this sort of actual negative number. And then of course we wanna put a minus sign in front of that so it actually becomes negative. I hope this makes sense. I have a video on two's complement, which is much more visual. So if, if this isn't making sense to you, go and take a look at that. And else we're just gonna return the existing value because it was already positive, so that's good. Um, so now we can just wrap this whole thing in 
as i16. And I'm probably doing something really stupid here in, uh, in terms of Python. I think I can probably, and I'll just check this quickly. <laughs> I should have checked this before, but I think I can do something like value dot um, as bytes. I don't have a value at this point, that's true. Um, if I had value equals one, do value dot as two bytes, I think. And then the length is gonna be two. And yeah, the in this case, the, we want little endian, so little and signed. Yeah, signed, true. I think that is the signed argument here. Great, okay, so actually I probably didn't need to write that function at all. I should have just thought ahead of time of the language I was actually using. Um, but in that case, we can do this. So that's a little bit, I guess that's a little bit bad. Um, Okay, and then we shift down the byte by two positions and then we are just encoding the next thing. And of course, if these were all zeros in these positions, then this wouldn't really do anything, but this works great. Okay, so now we have a function to encode a single byte of our hidden information into uh, a sample. So I think what we'll do for the next part is we know we have enough information available to us. So I think I will just do for i in range and the range is going to be the length of our parent bytes. And I think I'll keep a, an offset here, a separate offset that we'll use to offset into the, um, let's call this offset as well, if I'm going to do that. So we'll have a separate offset into the data itself. And what we're going to do here is essentially call right hidden byte. Um, I guess we could actually, we don't really need to do this. We could actually do for byte in parent bytes, and then we can just loop over the bytes themselves. And we can encode this byte uh, with this data at this offset. And then the offset needs to move forward by four, uh, four bytes. And I guess we could have this like return the number of bytes. If we want to just be a little bit like, there's no technical reason that you need to encode two bits at a time. You could encode one bit at a time. Um, you could encode three bits at a time. Of course, the more information you encode per sample, the, the more you distort the original signal and the more detectable you make the hiding. Um, Paradoxically speaking, actually hiding one bit is probably more likely to be detected because um, it's a very common technique to just hide one bit of information per channel. <coughs> and the tools that actually look for this kind of thing, they will, they will try with one bit. Um, so, but I think just, for, just on the off chance, two will work better just because most tools aren't gonna look at two. Uh, but yeah, this isn't, please keep in mind this isn't actually a good way of like really hiding protective information if you want that just use encryption and then you can even use your encrypted bytes uh, and put them in with steganography but yeah this isn't protecting your data so please don't i know i'm going to get comments about that if i don't say it so i'll say it okay so this is a little bit better this allows us to you know change the number of bits a little bit more easily. I'm not gonna change it, but if you wanna play around with it, you certainly can. Um, so actually by the end of this, we should have encoded our information. But again, remember I, I said that I wanted to encode the size, um, the size of a file. I also wanna encode that. So let's do that quickly before we actually go into the, the data itself. So the size of this file is just the length of parrot bytes. And I think what I'm gonna do is to, I'm gonna say that the size, um, let's call it hidden file size. 
let's say this is the length of the parrot bytes and then let's do the same trick let's do the two bytes thing and let's make this a 32-bit integer so let's do four bytes and we'll use little endian and yeah so now we've got a little endian encoded four byte representation of the file size and before we do um, anything else we'll just write that into the, the data so four byte in uh, in the hidden file size just do exactly the same thing and I guess we could like concatenate these together and that kind of thing but uh, yeah that's it that's actually it so we're going to encode the size then encode the file itself and then in the end we should write this file back out so let's do uh, with f uh, sorry with open and let's just call this um, test hidden wave and this time we're going to write a binary file uh, we will do f dot write and of course we need to like re-encode this back into a wave file right we we passed it out and now we have an object kind of like uh, just a dictionary object with all of these values inside and we need to like wrap this back up into an actual you know set of wave bytes and luckily uh, construct makes that really easy so you can do rate wave struct dot build and then uh, there is do i see even a build file there i don't know how that api works so i'm not gonna i'll just stick with what i'm doing for now but that is probably a better way of doing it um, we've actually been mutating the original data, so we can actually just write the whole wave past uh, structure back. And this should work. Um, let's try this out. Let's see how many errors we get here. Okay, so two bytes takes exactly two positional arguments and we give, we'll give them three. So apparently you actually need to say this is signed with a keyword argument. So we'll do it like that. Okay, and then in is too big to convert. Oh, that's in, that's interesting. Um, how does that work then? Because this is this can only be a sixteen bit number, right? I guess maybe it has a problem with the fact that. Um, hmm. 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 <laughs> I'm wondering if it matters that I'm wondering if I could just omit the signed part and this would take care of itself. Actually, don't know. Um, okay, so that probably didn't work. Um, something went wrong. Okay, during the handling of the above exception, uh, the required argument is not an integer. Uh, okay, so maybe that's not going to work. So I think let's go <laughs> let's go back to the as sixteen issue. I'll go and look up how that I should have done this uh, later on. It would just take a value, and <laughs> if the value ended with hex eight thousand produces a non-zero value, we will return negative value xor with fffff. Take all of that. Add one. That does two's complement and otherwise just return the value itself. And let's get rid of that. And we will call as u16. Okay, that seemed to work. So I'm going to take a look at the test hidden wave. We'll see if this still sounds like a wave file. That sounds like a 440 hertz wave file to me. <laughs> so I, I'm just going to assume that worked correctly. And if it didn't, we'll have to do some debugging in a bit. But let's write the reverse operation now. Um, so let's write decode.py. And we're going to need some of the same stuff. So let's uh, bring these things in. So we're going to open test hidden. And that's going to be a wave bytes. We're going to pass them. Then we're going to get the data. And... Uh, yeah, so now we want to like recover the information from this. So let's first uh, read the size out. So just create another offset. 
And I guess we can write a, a def uh, read read byte. What do they call it? I called it hidden byte, right? So let's call it read hidden byte. And we're going to take um, uh, some data, I guess offset and data. And it, of course, in this API, we can't actually return the the number of bytes that uh, the, the 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 amount that we should push the offset forward because we have to return the byte itself. Um, no, that's not true. We can use Python's Python's tuple. So let's just do that. So the byte that we get out. It will start at zero and for i in range four. So we're going to do this four times again. Basically, we're going to take the byte and we are going to, uh, we're going to take whatever was in the byte to begin with. So we're going to need to do some shifting. So we're going to take the byte that we have, like the existing value, and uh, and we're going to shift it up by the shift amount. So in the beginning, that's zero. The byte won't move anywhere, and it will stay in place. And we're going to OR in um, data at offset, but just the bottom two bits, right? Because that's what we're interested in. Um, so that gives us that and then we can shift we can just add two each time because we know we're shifting two bits at a time and I think this will work I think this is all we need to do um, and it's offset plus I good good okay and then in the end we can return the byte of data and uh, next to it, we can return like the amount that gets shifted. So that's four. So when we start out here, we want to get the size. So size will equal zero. And in order to actually read the full size out, we need to um, uh, to do to do four operations, right? So size equals. Uh, so these are going to be the this is going to be the bottom byte because we're doing. No, this is not true. It's not the bottom byte. This is going to be um, the least significant byte uh, because we did uh, little endium. So we're going to read a hidden byte um, at offset. And the data is just uh, wave bytes. Oh, no, it's data, of course. Um, I'm trying to think of just a nice way of doing this. Like, I guess I'll just do it like uh, in a loop again. So this is going to be uh, going to get byte and uh, yeah, the the increment. Let's call it. So size is going. We're going to or equal. We just have another shift variable, I guess. So it's going to be size shifted up by the shift amount and then oring in the byte. And then this time shift, uh, we're adding eight bits at a time because now we're reading a full byte. And we need to increment the offset. So increment the offset by um, uh, the increment each time. Okay, uh, just for a sanity check, let's uh, print out the file size here. So hidden file size is going to be size. And we will decode. So that doesn't look correct to me. <laughs> that doesn't look correct at all. Um, so I'm messing this up somehow. <laughs> I'm messing this up somehow. Um, okay, what's going wrong? So presumably, so we're reading a byte. Uh, reading a byte. The byte is 
the byte that we have shifted up by the shift amount and then oring in the bottom two bits of data, then the shift amount goes up each time. I think what I'm doing wrong here is that um, I don't, I shouldn't actually shift the byte up by this incrementing shift amount. That doesn't make sense. I should be shifting it up by two each time. So, um, because every time we're shifting the byte, so I don't need to be ever increasing that. And I guess it will be the same here, right? I don't really need a separate shift variable. I can just shift up by eight bits at a time and hopefully, well, I mean, that's a smaller number, but that's definitely still not right. <laughs> um, no, this is not, uh, something's going wrong here. So I think, um, let's print out each byte and let's print it out in Uh, well, let's print out what we're getting from here. So print hidden file size, run encode again. So that's zero. So that's definitely not correct. <laughs> this didn't, didn't work apparently. Oh, it's just the, oh wait, no, but that's right. The length of parrot bytes. I don't understand why this is, uh, if I just do this, the length of parrot bytes is 26. Like, why is this not encoding this correctly? Wait, why also, oh, parrot bytes? Yeah, what's going on here? If I look at this, I see two bytes here. Hidden file size. The length of the hidden file size is four. This is so strange, like why, it just seems that there are two bytes in there, right? Uh, Oh, SF. Okay, yeah, it's not showing the actual sort of the value here. So if I were to like list this and just see the value. So we get 83 and 102. Okay, and then here each byte with decode Get one nine seven and one five three. So, oh uh, yeah, I know what I'm doing wrong. Yeah, so I shouldn't be shifting. Um, I shouldn't be shifting the byte. I should be shifting the the bits that are coming in from the data. So this is not correct. Getting there eventually. So <laughs> I think we do need a shift. So we'll take all of that and shift that up by shift. And then, then we can shift by two each time. I think this will still work because, um, uh, no, this also won't work, right? This is the same, same thing. So actually I, I also want to shift here and, um, we're going to read the byte. It's going to be the existing size ord with the byte that we've read, shifted up by the shift amount and the shift amount. It goes up by eight each time. So let's try that again. Okay, that's the number, 26195. We've made some progress. Um, okay. So now we've actually got the size. We can, um, we can iterate that many bytes. Uh, so let's make a uh, hidden data, which will be an empty byte array. And uh, for i in range, and we are going to, uh, we are going to read this many bytes. So it's gonna be uh, size. Uh, byte array, or not byte array, hidden data dot append, um, read hidden byte. 
Oh, I guess we want to do this trick, right? Uh, we're going to append by, and we are going to progress offset forward by the incrementing amount. Okay, then this should contain our file in the end. So I think what we want to do is just with open parrot hidden dot jpeg mysterious write a binary file and let's just do f dot write uh, the hidden data. Okay, let's try that. Run decode. Unsupported operation right. That's interesting. Oh yeah, because that should be as f. So it's weird. We actually got something parrot hidden here. Like, I don't know where, like does that f variable stick around from up here? That's kind of weird. Let's just delete this because I, I don't want to spoil the actual reveal of that. Okay, so parrot hidden. <laughs> That's the parrot. That is definitely the parrot. So we successfully hidden this image inside a WAV file, this file, um, without any appreciable difference in the sound. And if we were to open this up in Audacity, um, which I'm not going to do now because I haven't configured OBS for that right now. But if I had done that, what we would have seen is that the waveform does not change. Um, it looks pretty much exactly the same. And the fact is, if we're talking about just this volume of sound, this number of bits, even if we're recording perfectly, I mean, in this case, it's a tone. So it's, there's some argument to be had that, you know, there is a perfect way that this should look. But if I was just recording my voice and, and I had five seconds of audio of my voice, there is no real way of telling that, you know, those bits were you know, had been messed with. Now I say that there's no real way of telling, uh, but that's not quite true. I mean, uh, you can actually do statistical analysis on data. And especially if you understand kind of how that data is in a general form, um, you can pick out patterns from it. So uh, this is what's done in cryptography, right? If you, this is the reason you don't design your own cryptography is because uh, people who are really smart and good at math uh, no methodologies to take your uh, your sort of encrypted data and extract the information out of it. Um, you know, find the places where there are patterns, like find that if I change this bit, this bit changes. Well, it's the same thing here. Um, if we were to separate these 16 bits of information, so we have all the samples and we have the 16 bits, if we were to separate them out into individual channels, and kind of do an analysis of how those bits change over time, we might have a profile of how we expect each of those bits to change um, according to how a bit of that magnitude would change in a typical file. And what we might find is that these bits deviate a little bit from that, that norm. We might be able to draw a bell curve and see, actually, when we're quite outside the boundary of the normal way uh, that the, the 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 first bit of information in this uh, file should look. So it's not foolproof, but it's very hard to detect. Like if, especially imagine you just had a music collection, right? And you chose a file at random to store, you know, a couple hundred bytes worth of information in. Um, it's going to be really hard, really, really hard for anyone but sort of like nation state level attackers to even come close to, you know, getting into that, like uh, exploring that as an option, because it's just so far away from the norm. Now, again, I don't really advise doing this, but I do think it's really interesting. I really like the idea of kind of, uh, you know, piggybacking information into these additional channels without actually sort of really losing information. You can, uh, you can imagine though, that we have actually sort of compressed the information of the wave file, so to speak, we've quantized it um, away from you know a nice lossless format like it is, and we've sort of taken away those bottom three bits of information, and now we put noise in there essentially, right? Uh, from the perspective of the wave file signal, that's that's noise. That's not actual information carrying in terms of the signal that it thinks it should be carrying as far as a wave file can think. Now, I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope that's been somewhat informative. 
um, try it out with an image. You know, it, what I would really love to hear from someone is what, what's an interesting format that you can find that isn't necessarily images or audio that you can stuff some, some data into covertly. I would love to hear about it, so let me know in the comments. Um, now, I'll see you in the next one.